What's happening, musical scientists? Trumpeter Bobby Spellman here. And about a year ago, I put out a video called Don't Tighten Your Lips to Play High Notes, in which I talked about a technique for changing registers on the trumpet that has been a big help to all of my trumpet students, especially in the beginning stages of playing the trumpet. Now, in that video, I discussed what little I knew about fluid dynamics. And in the process of making that video, I started thinking about the fact that even though I'd been playing trumpet for 25 years and teaching for the better part of 18 years, I'd never really done a deep dive into the physics of what makes the trumpet work. And most of the information that I had about the physics of the trumpet had come from other musicians. So I decided to do a deep dive into the physics of the trumpet and go to battle with my own ignorance by reading five books on the science of musical sound and the physics of the trumpet. And I also read a number of studies that have been done on various aspects to, uh, of the physics of the trumpet. And I spoke with uh, physics professors and PhD students, as well as other trumpet players and teachers. And in the process, I found out a lot of really interesting information about the way that the trumpet works. And I would like to share it with you in this two-part series on the physics of the trumpet. We will start with this episode in which we will talk about uh, the basic mechanics of how the trumpet works, what is going on in the trumpet to make the sound of the trumpet that we know and love. And in the process, I'll play a giant homemade trumpet with this butane torch on this episode of... Trumpet with Bob. All right, before we get started, I just wanted to say a big thanks to all of the subscribers to the channel. We couldn't do it without you. And we here at the Ridgewood School of Music will be working to create all kinds of new videos like this one for you. And in order to facilitate the creation of new videos, we've put together a Ridgewood School of Music Patreon page where subscribers will have access to in-depth follow-up videos as well as solo transcriptions, musical exercises, and all kinds of fun stuff. So if you want to help in the creation of new videos like this and become a subscriber, you can find us on patreon.com slash Ridgewood School of Music or follow the link in the description below to become a subscriber to the Patreon. All right, thanks, gang. And without further ado, let's dive in to the physics of the trumpet. trumpet with Bob. If we're dealing with music, then we're dealing with sound. And if we're dealing with sound, then we're dealing with vibrations. Every musical instrument is essentially a vibration machine. It's easy to understand the vibrating mechanism on this drum. I hit the drum head, the drum head vibrates, drum head causes the air around and inside the drum to vibrate, and those vibrations make their way through the air molecules into my ears. Similarly, it's easy to understand the vibrating mechanism on this banjo. I pluck the string, which causes the string to vibrate, the vibrations go down through the bridge into the head of the banjo, and once again into the air molecules, making their way to our eager ear holes. So what then is vibrating in the trumpet? Well, on the surface, it may seem obvious. Our lips are vibrating when we buzz them into the mouthpiece. However, thinking about our lips vibrating as being the main source of the sound of the trumpet may lead us to believe that the trumpet is really just a very complicated mouthpiece amplifier. And that's not really an accurate description of what's going on. I can create a simple mouthpiece amplifier by taking this funnel and putting a mouthpiece in the other end. And that may sound something like this. Now, you'll notice a couple things about my mouthpiece amplifier. Number one, while it does make the mouthpiece louder, it uh, does not have a great tone. And if I brought this thing to a gig, I can be sure that I'd be fired from the band. The other thing that you'll notice about my mouthpiece amplifier is that I can play any of the notes up and down the sort of range of the mouthpiece without any regard for individual notes. I can just portamento my way all the way from the low range up to the high range, like this. Ah! However, in a trumpet, you'll notice that it's very hard to play outside of the harmonics that the trumpet allows. Until you get into the very high register, then it becomes a little bit of a different thing. So, what's going on with the trumpet? In physics terms, the trumpet is known as a closed open pipe, 
where the closed part is where your lips meet the mouthpiece and the open part is the bell. Now for context, an example of an open open pipe would be a flute where you have an opening at the mouthpiece as well as at the end of the flute. And that's gonna cause the instrument to resonate in a slightly different way, but that's a little bit outside of the scope of this video. So our closed open pipe here is filled with air molecules. And when those air molecules become excited, they create within the trumpet what is called a longitudinal standing wave. Now, a longitudinal wave means that the air molecules are gonna be moving parallel with the direction of the wave. Not unlike this slinky we have here. So you can get a little bit of a visual demonstration of the way that the air molecules might move within the pipe of the trumpet. It's the vibration of this air column inside the pipe that really gives us the sound of the trumpet. Now it's our lips job to excite these air molecules inside the trumpet, but at the end of the day, it's really that longitudinal standing wave that's gonna give us the sound that we're used to hearing from the trumpet. Now, if this is a little hard to imagine, I'll prove it to you. In theory, we should be able to play a pipe by exciting the air molecules, whether or not we're using the vibration from our lips or whether we excite those air molecules in a different way. So in order to prove it, I built a giant trumpet out of a pipe and we're gonna go outside and I'm gonna play this thing with fire. Woo, don't try this one at home, gang. All right, gang. Well, here we have a fake trumpet made out of a pipe. And here we have a butane torch. I'm going to fashion this together. I think the bore size on this is going to be big enough that we're going to be able to get a little sound out of this by exciting the air molecules inside of the pipe. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. Woo! So there you can hear the tone coming from the pipe. It's about a C. The fundamental pitch of the pipe is a C. We're not doing anything to create that except just blowing fire into the air inside the tube. Pretty cool, right? There it is. All right, it's starting to get pretty hot. So we're gonna call it a day on this, but I think you get the idea. You can vibrate those air molecules even without having to deal with blowing air through the tube. All right, now that we understand what's vibrating in the trumpet, we can bring our lips back into the mix and get a little bit deeper into what uh, makes the trumpet work as a musical instrument. So when we buzz our lips into the mouthpiece, our lips function as a little meaty valve that is going to open and close quickly, feeding fast puffs of air into the trumpet. Now those puffs of air are going to excite the air molecules creating that standing wave that we were talking about earlier. Now it would appear on its surface as though the standing wave might move in from the mouthpiece through the trumpet all the way through all the plumbing and out the bell into the air and into the ears of your adoring fans. However, there is one more layer of complexity to this system that allows the trumpet to really work as an effective musical instrument. When the wave gets to the end of the tubing on the trumpet, the relationship between the wavelength and the shape of the bell causes the grand majority of the wave to be reflected back into the trumpet again. Now, this is where the shape of the bell becomes very important because if the bell was too gradually flared, then too much of the wave would escape the trumpet and playing the trumpet would feel a little bit more like playing this funnel. However, if there was no flare to the bell, then too much of the wave would be reflected back into the trumpet and you wouldn't get the beautiful sound that you're used to hearing from the instrument. Now, what's especially interesting is that the relationship of the wavelength to the bell means that with lower notes, more of the wave is reflected back into the trumpet, whereas with higher notes, uh, the, the bell serves as a little bit more of a loudspeaker and more efficiently uh, projects those higher notes into the atmosphere. 
Now, what I found particularly interesting about all of this is only maybe 3% of the energy is actually escaping from the bell into the air. The other 97% of the energy stays within the trumpet and ends up dissipating as friction in the walls inside the trumpet. So the combination of the wave and the bell of the trumpet allows that standing wave to exist within the trumpet by reflecting that wave back into the trumpet from the open end of the pipe. All right, so if we're trying to produce sound in the air, why would it be important that the wave be reflected back into the trumpet? Well, ultimately, this is going to create that standing wave, and for us, very importantly, that's what's going to allow our lips to get locked into a feedback loop with the air molecules inside the trumpet to allow us to play these various partials rather than just playing willy-nilly all over the possible spectrum of the horn. So to get a little deeper into that, I want to talk about a little bit more about how these air waves work. Uh, without getting too complicated here, a, a wave, a longitudinal standing wave, is going to have what are called nodes and antinodes. Now, a node is a place in the wave in which there is uh, the least motion or the smallest amplitude, and an antinode is where there is the most motion back and forth. Now, it's a little harder to conceptualize on the trumpet, but it's easy to see on this banjo. Here, if I pluck the banjo string right in the middle, the nodes are going to be right at the bridge and at the nut here on the top of the neck where the string isn't moving very much at all. Whereas in the middle, it's moving quite a lot. Now in a trumpet, one of those anti-nodes where there is quite a lot of molecular motion is right around where your lips meet the mouthpiece. Now this creates a fluctuating pressure that interacts with the pressure that you're creating with your lungs in the inside of your mouth. Now, as that pressure moves up and down around this part of the trumpet, that's going to lock your lips into a feedback loop with the air molecules inside the trumpet, creating uh, the various notes that you get, the various partials that you get on the trumpet. So when you notice that you can't just play, you know, any note necessarily going up and down the trumpet, but rather we're getting locked into these partials, that's because these various pressure nodes and antinodes are interacting with the pressure in our mouths in order to allow our lips to open and close at exactly the speed or the frequency, let's say, that will enable us to continuously feed energy to that standing wave. So as we go, you can feel your lips getting locked into that feedback loop with the standing wave inside the trumpet, and that's how we get these various partials on the trumpet. Now we can bend those notes outside of the resonant frequencies of the trumpet in such a way that we're, we're, our lips are not vibrating at exactly the same uh, frequency as you have in the inside of the trumpet. However, you'll notice doing that is very difficult and it creates a different sound on the trumpet. You're not gonna get that beautiful, pure tone that you're looking for on the trumpet. But when our lips come back in and we're allowing our lips to uh, become a part of that feedback loop with the air molecules inside the trumpet, that's when the trumpet is really gonna ring uh, and we're gonna get a really nice tone on the trumpet. It's gonna make it much easier for us to play. Now, what makes the trumpet playable as an instrument, rather than just a novelty, pretty one note generator, is the fact that the trumpet features a number of resonant modes based on the fundamental frequency of the instrument. Now, we call these modes partials, and they sound a little something like this. Now we can change the resonant modes that we're accessing on the trumpet based on the vibration of our lips. By altering the vibration of our lips, we can access these various resonant modes in order to get all these different notes over the range of the instrument. Now, one of the other interesting things about the construction of the trumpet is that the shape of the instrument has a lot to do with which of those partials we have access to. So in theory, if you created a C trumpet, 
that was perfectly conical. That is that it was going to taper throughout the whole construction of the instrument. You would expect to be able to get a pedal uh, C, which would be C2, and then you would get an octave above that C, that would be where our low C is, then you would get a G, a C above that, an E above that, a G above that, a flat B flat above that, a C above that, a D and an E above that, etc, etc. Now alternatively, if you had a perfectly cylindrical tube where there was no taper, then you would get a fairly odd uh, number of harmonics, you'd actually get the odd harmonics, uh, but you would get uh, a series of different notes, it would look a little bit more like this. Now this is going to be pretty hard to use uh, as a, a trumpet player, you know, you're going to have a hard time with this. Uh, but you know, it's interesting because we talk about the trumpet as being a cylindrical instrument in contrast to the cornet or flugelhorn, which we regard as more of conical instruments. However, uh, the trumpet, as with all brass instruments, is a combination of a conical instrument with a cylindrical instrument. Uh, mostly because if we had a purely conical instrument, it would be very difficult to set up the uh, valve block in here in such a way that it would work functionally as an instrument. So, I would like to take a little time now to give a, a round of applause to all of the ingenious trumpet and brass manufacturers from the beginning of time who figured out a way to shape this thing in such a way that we can get all of the harmonics that we need to play this as a musical instrument uh, while it still functions as an instrument uh, technically. All right, so everybody, a round of applause for the amazing uh, trumpet manufacturers through the ages who figured out how to do what seems impossible. Now, the one way that the uh, the trumpet has been, the, the compromise that has been made in creating trumpets uh, that allows us to get all of these partials, even though it's a largely cylindrical instrument, is the fact that our pedal is not a pedal C in our terms, as we would expect it, but rather it's a whole step below that. So our pedal note is our B flat on the trumpet at concert, a flat, uh, but that means that all the other harmonics can be right in tune in the way that we need them in order to play music with all the other musicians. All right, and from here, things get pretty easy. The valves on a trumpet and the slide on a trombone serve to elongate the tubing in such a way that we can change the fundamental pitch of the instrument in order to get seven new sets of harmonics. So going through the various valve combinations to get those seven different sets of harmonics, that's gonna sound like this. That combination of partials with the various valve combinations gives us all 12 notes of the chromatic scale and allows us to play sweet, sweet music with the other musicians. Woo! All right, well, that's a lot of information, uh, but it's still only the half of it. So in our next video, we will talk about the physiology of playing the trumpet, what's going on in your body while you're playing, and we'll discuss a couple of controversies and unsolved mysteries about what's happening in your body while you're playing the trumpet. I hope you found this information as interesting as I did, and uh, if you'd like to dive a little deeper into some of the subjects that we covered today, I will put links in the description below to the books that I've read and some of the studies that I've looked at, various things of that nature. You can dive deep and check out some more information on the physics of sound and the physics of the trumpet itself. All right, gang, have a wonderful time practicing, and I will catch you on the next one. See ya! All right, friends, thanks so much for checking out this video. We hope it helps in your quest for the majesty of musical self-expression. If you like what we're doing here, you can give this video a like and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. And if you'd like to support the creation of new videos like this, you can become a subscriber on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Ridgewood School of Music. There, subscribers will have access to more in-depth follow-up videos, as well as solo transcriptions, various musical exercises, and all kinds of fun stuff. If you'd like to follow me on my musical adventures, you can find me on Instagram, at Bob Speltman, and you can follow the Ridgewood School of Music's other social media pages by following the links in the description below. The Ridgewood School of Music is currently accepting new students online 
or in person in the New York City area. If you're interested in lessons, you can find us at www.ridgewoodschoolofmusic.com or you can send us an email at ridgewoodschoolofmusic at gmail.com and we can set you up with a great teacher for the instrument and the style of music that you're interested in studying. All right, gang, well, have a wonderful time practicing and we'll catch you on the next one. See ya.